I have to quit. There are three curves that define almost any type of situation facing you as you try to accomplish something. First up, you have the cliff. This is where the longer you do something, the better it feels to continue. In other words, the pain of quitting gets bigger and bigger over time. An example of this would be cigarettes, which have been designed to be addictive. This chart shows the pleasure of smoking over time. The cliff, emphysema. In other words, it's where you can't quit until you fall off and the whole thing falls apart. Although rare, it is scary and will lead to failure. Next up is the cul-de-sac. Translation, dead end. It's so simple, it doesn't even have a chart. This is where you work and work and work, but nothing really changes. It doesn't get better, but it doesn't get worse either. Hence the phrase, dead end job. If on this path, you need to get off it and fast. This is keeping you from doing something else, something better. Staying on it will lead to failure. Finally, we have the dip. Almost everything in life worth doing is controlled by the dip. You start something new and it's so much fun. It could be golf, acupuncture, piloting a plane. It's new and exciting at first and easy to stay engaged, but then, you hit the dip. This is a set of artificial screens set up to keep people like you out. It's when the hard work and the grind kicks in and you start to wonder why you thought this was a good idea in the first place. It's the long slog between starting and mastery. Take for example a CEO. It's pretty easy to be a CEO in all fairness. What isn't easy though is a 25 year dip to get there. The time when you had to keep your head down, do as you were told and suck it up. The time where you had to work twice as hard and long as everybody else and kiss the boss's ass. Successful people don't just ride out or survive the dip, they lean into it. They push harder and change the rules as they go. Anything worth doing has a dip. It's that very dip that creates scarcity, which in turn creates value. It gives you a competitive edge. It can turn you into the best in the world and that has its own benefits. Our culture celebrates superstars. We reward number one, and those rewards are heavily skewed. It's typical for number one to get 10 times that of number 10, and 100 times that of number 100. Take, for example, the top 10 ice cream flavors. Vanilla is way ahead of the rest, and it's almost always like this. This is called Zip's Law. Winners win big because the marketplace loves a winner. Being number one makes you the best choice, and therefore the one that's most likely to be chosen. Anyone that's going to hire you is going to wonder if you're the best choice, but best as in the best for them right now based on what they know, and world as in their world, the world they have access to. The mass market is dying. There are now one million micro markets, and each micro market has a best. But again, in order to be the best, you need to get through the dip. The thing is, people want tried and tested. They will wait for something to be standardized and authenticated. So they don't really care about your product or service at the beginning. In all fairness, why should they? So you need to ride out the dip and slowly build your audience. Remember, there's no such thing as overnight success. In fact, Microsoft failed twice with Windows, four times with Word, and three times with Excel. But they persevered and continued to iterate until they rode it out. The focus that leads you through the dip to the other side is rewarded. Take for example a woodpecker. They can tap 20,000 times on 20,000 trees and get nowhere. It's just busy work. Or they could tap 20,000 times on one tree and get dinner. Success goes to those who obsess. The dip is the best thing. It's the reason you're here, so you need to get through it. But how? Let's use the Boston Marathon for this example. Here's a chart showing the percentage of people quitting the marathon by mile. And as you can see, no one quits at mile 20. Why? Because they can see the finish line. People don't quit when they can see the finish line. Persistent people can visualize the light at the end of the tunnel. But be smart, don't imagine any light when there is none. Weigh up whether you're going through short-term pain for long-term gain. If there is no long-term gain, then quit now. It is brave to stick the dip out, mature to not bother starting it in the first place, but stupid to start, invest time and money, and then give up in the middle of the dip. Because giving up in the dip is a short-term decision made in that moment. Here's a quote from ultramarathoner Dick Collins. Decide before the race the conditions that will cause you to stop and drop out. You don't want to be out there saying, well, gee, my leg hurts. I'm a little dehydrated. I'm sleepy. I'm tired and it's cold and windy. And then talk yourself into quitting. If you are making a decision based on how you feel at that moment, you are probably making the wrong decision. So write it down. 
Write down under what circumstances you're willing to quit and when, and then stick with it. Because if it was worth doing when you started, then it's a waste to quit in the dip. So quitting whilst you're in the dip is bad and a total no-no. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't quit. In fact, you absolutely should and must quit in order to succeed. Quitting is a great strategy, despite being told for the majority of our lives that quitting is bad, that quitting means failure. In fact, we quit to avoid failure. So what then should we quit? We need to quit the cul-de-sacs, the things that we are just coping with, because they are wasting our time and misdirecting our energy and efforts. We'd be better to quit, to free up our time, to focus all our efforts on getting through the dip. It's not easy though, and it takes courage to quit. You may even have to overcome some pride, and it can be quite scary, but it really is okay. In fact, the system expects us to quit. Think about gyms. If everybody with a membership turned up, they wouldn't have space for everyone. They bank on you quitting. So, if you're now thinking about quitting, or not quitting, then you've succeeded. It's the first step to becoming the best in the world. The next step is to ask yourself some questions. One, is this a dip, a cliff, or a cul-de-sac? Two, if it's a cul-de-sac, how can I change it into a dip? Three, is my persistence going to pay off in the long run? Four, when should I quit? I need to decide now, not when I'm in the middle of it, and not when part of me is begging to quit. Five, if I quit this task, Will it increase my ability to get through the dip on something more important? Six, if I like my job, is it time to quit? Seven, are you avoiding the remarkable as a way of quitting without quitting? Remember, if it scares you, it might be a good thing to try. I'll leave you with this. All our successes are the same, all our failures too. We succeed when we do something remarkable. We fail when we give up too soon. We succeed when we are the best in the world at what we do. We fail when we get distracted by tasks. We don't have the guts to quit. Well, damn. This book definitely gave me some food for thought. Uh, thank you, Seth. So, uh, let's break it down and have some real talk for a second. After reading the book, to me, the obvious solution is that I should quit my day job and put all of my efforts into growing this channel and my podcast. And I can't deny that that would be absolutely amazing. There is a little barb inside of me jumping for joy at this prospect. But unfortunately, there's also a little barb inside of me that doesn't like the sound of this because it's a much more risk averse, cautious barb that also usually wins when it comes to any decision making. So whilst I would love to quit my job right now, I just can't do it. And a part of me actually wonders whether it's that job that's giving me a routine. So it's what's forcing me to be more intentional with my time. At the end of the day after work, I only have a very limited number of hours to get stuff done. So I have to focus on what's really, really important and what absolutely has to get done. So if I all of a sudden had 40 extra hours in my week, would I get more done or would I just waste them? Like the grass isn't always greener, right? So would I still get up at a decent hour? Would I still try and squeeze in a workout between evening Zoom meetings? Or would I just kind of wake up and think I've got all the time in the world? and then proceed to binge watch anything and everything on Netflix. <laughs> so perhaps there is a middle ground and I think going part-time is that middle ground. It's not black and white after all. So going part-time would give me some hours back in my day, but it would also give me routine. So I could invest in my channels, but I could also you know, make sure I'm up at a decent hour. It would also mean that there's still income coming in, which would make the whole process a whole lot scary. So it seems like the best next step. And that would be my next goal. Once I go part-time, I can reassess the situation from there. But I'm also not quite ready to go part-time yet. Instead, I have done the assignment that Seth set out in the book and I have set my quitting conditions. So when these are hit, that's when I'll take this step. And I can hear you asking, well, what are you even quitting then? Um, I'm quitting everything else. So everything that doesn't help me achieve this goal, anything that isn't a Derek Sivers hell yeah, which is what we discussed in last week's video. So anything that takes my attention away from what's really, really important to me right now and what my focus is, so the podcast and the YouTube channel. And at the moment, that's a lot of media consumption. So <laughs> Netflix, but it's time to focus and make this work. I don't want to regret not trying or giving it my all. I don't want to have to wonder what if, and I absolutely definitely don't want to see others doing what I know that I am more than capable of. 
So it's time to prepare for the dip. See you guys. <laughs>